Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. It's rare for me to find someone who writes a book about something that I'm really, really interested that I run into and can contact. It's even rarer when there's somebody who's written three books all about different topics that, you know, if I had the time, the energy, and the brilliance to do it, would have done them myself. This man has written a book about stand-up comedy. He's also written a book about growing up with old-time radio, so he loves radio very much. And now he's written a book about the culture of America through the 50s and 60s, through the television of the time, and most specifically through Ed Sullivan. To, um, to have those kinds of interests, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to talk to this particular person, especially since he's also been a theater critic and a journalist and a humorist. It's like if you took all the things that I put after my name, you, <laughs> you could put them right after his, only he does them more uh, prolifically and probably better. His name is Gerald Nachman, and he's with us on Dave's Gone By in the neighborhood. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate me being here, you being here, too. Well, yeah, it's great. I mean, the, the amazing thing is, when I saw your name and the, you had written the Ed Sullivan book and these other books, your name started to ring bells because you were a New York columnist and writer and critic for quite a few years. Yeah, I was. I was, a uh, hundred years ago, I was at the, the old New York Post as a feature writer and a celebrity profiler, and then more recently, uh, recently meaning 30 years ago, I was at the 35, I guess, uh, I was at the New York Daily News, and I wrote uh, a humor column for seven years, uh, for the New York Daily News. No, okay, let's, let's, let's backtrack already to the New York Post, because the way we think of the New York Post now is this incredibly right-wingy Republican rag. Right. Wasn't, wasn't it liberal who we were writing for it? It was, it was New York's most liberal paper, and uh, uh, I wasn't quite aware of that at the time. I'm from California. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland, actually, and I, I knew almost nothing about the New York Post, but I wanted to go to New York, so I left San Jose, uh, uh, where I was writing a, uh, a TV and humor column, and just left and quit and went back to New York, because I always had a New York bug. I wanted to see what New York was all about, so I went back there when I was about 24, and um, Did you ended have... up, uh, it's a roundabout story, but I ended up at the New York Post, because a friend of mine who was in New York told me that it was... Uh, the best paper for writers, and it really was a good writer's paper. They let you, they let you, they let you alone, and uh, gave you kind of a lot of freedom. But they were very glamorous days for me, being in New York and young and all that. It's the best time to go to New York is when you're young. Well, let me let me ask a quick question. A couple of things. First of all, you left the San Jose paper, that you, a, a job that you've gotten right out of college. I mean, nobody gets that lucky. Well, I mean, you were obviously good, but but the fact is. I, yeah, you had right, that, excuse me, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. But you went to New York before you had the job waiting for you at the post? You just figured, I'm going to go and see what happens? Yeah, actually, to backtrack one little step, sure. I, I was actually in college uh, when I got the job at the, at the San Jose Mercury. I was writing a, a humor column in the, camp, in the college paper, and I got hired out of that. And I was my senior year, and I was writing a TV column, which was a huge break for, you know, for, for big, fairly big yeah. Yeah, I, I went back to New York just because I had this thing about New York. I wanted to see what it was all about. I'd, I'd read about it. It had, you know, terrific lore and appeal and glamour and everything else. And I, I didn't want to stay in San Jose forever. My family was somewhat appalled because they thought, you know, you've got a great job on a good paper. and Why give that up? And I, you know, I couldn't argue with that except... You have a Jewish family, I can tell. But I had this wanderlust, uh, and I wanted to go to New York, and as I said, I, I had to see what it was all about. And, you know, it's a way to test yourself, and I'd been pretty successful, and I was pretty young, so I thought, well, I'll see if I if my luck holds out, and uh, eventually it did. But I didn't, I didn't, I started as a summer intern at the old old liberal New York Post, and I didn't get, they didn't keep me because I had, because they had me doing newspaper uh, hard news, and I'm a terrible reporter at that. Hmm. I love feature writing and column writing and, and, and reviewing. But you were able to jump to the Daily News after a certain point. Well, I went back and forth. I, I left the New York Post, uh, got married, I came back to San Francisco Bay Area, got a job at the uh, at the Oakland Tribune. Uh, in between the two New York papers, two New York papers, I was a theater and film critic at the Oakland Tribune.
doing for four and a half years. Then I wanted to go back to New York again, and so my wife and I went back to New York in 72, and uh, I caught on at the New York Daily News uh, fairly quickly, and uh, I was a feature writer for a while, and then I asked him if I could do a humor column, because that was my ultimate goal always. Hmm. And, and I talked him into it, and I did that for seven years. And then... I, that, that was in the 70s. Right, and then you, they decided, or you decided, that was enough. Yeah, I had, a, I had enough in New York. I kind of wanted to go back and get... I, I really, I, I don't know, that's one of those crossroad, crossroad decisions. You always wonder, you know, how it would have been if I'd stayed. And uh, I, I actually talked to the editor at the New York uh, Daily News and letting me continue writing my columns in San Francisco. It, it, it kind of involved, my wife wanted to move back here and... Uh, and I lived there, long, you know, seven years, and that's a long time. And I always say you don't realize what I never realized what a California guy I was until I lived in New York. Hmm. I love New York. I just got back from there. I love going once a year for, you know, a couple of weeks. And I get it out of my system, and I come back to reality. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, what people from New York say is, when they go out to the coast. Is Bay Area, although San Francisco is another another unreal place. Well, yeah. What is the difference between writing for an East Coast paper and a West Coast paper? Is not for me, you know, I just try to do my best, and uh, uh, I well, that's not maybe that's a little too flippant answer. There is a there is a difference, although so you try your hardest where we are, you know, whether it's Podunk or New York City, and uh, although the competition is rat, is a, a little stiffer in, in New York, there's no question about it. I think you I think you tend to play. Uh, over your head a little bit, as they say in sports, and I think I think you you write at your very, the very very top of your skill because you have to, to compete. So it's you know it's a, it's a it's a little faster game. There's no question about it. And now, are you doing a blog for somewhere? Are you uh, with a paper now or? No, no. I, I left the San Francisco Chronicle in 1993, 16 years ago, and I've been writing these three books that you mentioned uh, right. since then. And I I do write for a website. I don't have a blog. I do write for a website called thecolumnist.com and uh, I've been right, I was one of the co- four co-founders of it uh, see, 10 years ago and I write for them occasionally now tell us just a little bit about thecolumnists.com it's basically an aggregate or, or of people who yeah, it's about entertainment the arts sports and anything we want to write about it's, it's made up of a kind of a uh, sort of a conglomeration of uh, people that we that the four founders knew and then it's since branched out and so when I have something I want to get off my chest or when I can't sell it to someone else <laughs> it, <laughs> I, it will land on the columnist.com and I, actually I've, I've written you know probably a couple hundred pieces for them and well, here's, here's, you, you can go there and archive some of my stuff if, if anyone's interested so here's, here's the thing I mean you're a person like so many of my colleagues over the past few years I mean you have been in the newspaper and journalism business for a long time and often made the decision to leave a major paper when it just felt like time. But so many of my colleagues are in a situation where they're downsized or they've gone from being a full-time person to being, um, I guess, adjunct would be almost the word for it or, or you know, doing stuff on spec. How does a website like the columnists make a go of it? Where's the money from? There is no money. There is no money. It's totally money. Well, we don't lose money, but uh, the guy that runs it, has, you know, he's put in some, a little of his money just to maintain the site. But it's here's but that's a couple of hundred bucks. You know, that's, no ads, you know. although he's, he's, all, he's, he's looked into that possibility of getting ads for it. But that's, you need somebody to work at that full time. I don't understand how, how all that stuff works. So I'm totally a print guy, meaning pen and, you know, yeah. paper and ink. No, I was just sort of I, hoping I, I really, that... I don't yeah. really like... I don't believe there's anybody out there reading this stuff. So, <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I, I just don't get my, any feedback from it. And uh, if I write something that, that, that's in a newspaper or magazine, I, I usually get some feedback. And so it's writing on air to me. And, it's, it's you know, you have to do it because that's the new world. But it's not my preference at all. I'd much rather write for a, a newspaper or magazine. Well, speaking of uh, writers, one thing that did tickle me, I guess... Either when when you were on one of the major pace papers, you served on the committee that decided the Pulitzer Prize for uh, a play for drama. Yeah, I I, I got chosen because uh, somebody I knew was was on it, and they suggested that they needed a representative from the West Coast. When you were on the P- 
Pulitzer Committee. What year was that? And okay. what what was the play? What what did you guys select? Well, it's a play that hasn't been done very much. It's, it was called, uh, I think it was like 69 or something like that. It was a long time ago. And it was a great honor to be sure. You know, you fly back to New York and you meet in a room and you get to read or see the plays. And uh, it was a, a thing called the Kentucky Cycle. Oh, well, wait, that wasn't that long ago. It wasn't 69. Kentucky Cycle was... I don't know, maybe well, 79. Well, it was actually the year just before, I think, Angels in America was probably... Almost 89, because they did that on... But it was a long... It's like a seven-hour thing. Yeah, yeah. You go and you, 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 know, you take a lunch break or I mean, a, a dinner break. and it's a, it's a, it's a, It was quite a good play, considering how long it was. And I have very little... Uh, I get impatient easily, but I was I was held by it. It's a good play, but it, it takes a lot, big cast and it's very, uh, you know, complicated to produce because it's a long, long play. Yeah, no, I remember. They did it on... It came to Broadway at around the same time Angels in America did. That's and, right. After and, it won the right. Pulitzer, it came, it came to Broadway. I, I think it was done in L.A. or uh, originally at the at the uh, at the Armisen Theater. Talking about writing again, one of your books was about stand-up comedy. Seriously funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, the subtitle is "The Rebel Comedians of the 1950s and 60s." So it's not just about stand-up comedians; it's it's about a very specific era. And, and, you know, many of them were stand-ups, but I also dealt with the TV comedians and radio comedians, Bob and Ray and, you know, oh. Gene Shepard and people like that. Comedians who came along in that era, starting with Mort Saul and ending with Phyllis Diller, were sort of making satirical uh, social commentary, more than just, you know, any young men one-liners. So it was a very different kind of comedy, and uh, and that's and nobody had written a book about that then, and they then I don't know. If, well, they, I think there've been a couple of similar books since then, but I think mine is the most comprehensive. I like to think that anyway. So, who was the best interview that you had? The best putting, interview. Uh, uh, best interview. I mean, you, with, you um, talked to people like Steve Allen, Woody Allen, Jonathan Winters. Uh, when you, well, uh, yeah, I was just amazed. Uh, I think I have to say Mike Nichols, who got oh. me, who was you know him. Elaine Mays had a famous comedy team in the early 60s called Nichols and May, Mike Nichols and Elaine May, and he, was, he gave me an hour and 45 minutes, which was quite quite amazing, and uh, he's a busy guy uh, still, and uh, he was very honest, but I liked all of them that I got to. I got to, I, I didn't think I'd get to Woody Allen, I, and, you know, they promised me 20 minutes, and I mm-hmm. thought, oh, geez, how, I can barely you know, clear my throat in 20 minutes, so... But he ended up giving me 45 minutes, and he was he answered. You know, he was a very good interview, and very businesslike. He's not very personable, but he he answers honestly, and you know, gives me very can- gave me candid answers. And I like Jonathan Winters, who was kind of the most uh, I connected best with. Even though uh, hmm. uh, I talked I talked to him at his home outside Santa Barbara, and uh, he uh, he asked me to go to lunch with him. He's the only he's the only comedian who did that, and so I liked him for that, and uh, he was also very, very open and honest, and so we had lunch in town, and that was that was memorable for that reason. Well, was there anything that you gained by doing that book that you kind of didn't know going in, in other words, along the span of the late 50s, early 60s, that America was changing, the world was changing, and comedy was, was part of both the forefront and reflecting that, but what did you learn about Comedy from doing I don't know, the book. probably a whole lot because I dealt with about 20 comedians and their lives are very complicated. Their ups and downs, and uh, man, you know, many of them, you know, had a huge had a huge career and then went into a slide like Mort Saul and they, many of them, uh, almost all of them actually. I mean, uh, there were a few that went into TV and did incredibly well. Bill Cosby and Bob Newhart uh, specifically. But guys like Saul and, and even Shelley Berman had a long period when he wasn't when he wasn't very popular anymore. No, that's interesting. You know, that's the thing. Yeah. You explode, and then you know, then then people get used to you, or something happens, yeah. and you screw up your career somehow, or your life takes a bad turn, and so that happened with a lot of these people. Because you would figure that, various ways. Yeah. Yeah. You would figure that someone like Saul, who was doing topical material before, he would have rode the wave or ridden the wave, whereas. I guess, um, you know, as opposed to say a Shelley Berman, who might have been lumped in with more of the Catskill-y sort of comics because he wasn't political. 
Well, he wasn't Catskill at all. He was no, but just doing kind of erotic comedy. He was kind of a very personal kind of comedy. Mm. It was very different. And uh, uh, Saul had this huge burst of uh, excitement and, and was huge. And then he got way late because he got involved in the investigation of the Kennedy assassination. Oh, and he, yeah. he started, uh, you know, uh, you know, boring audiences by talking about his th conspiracy theories and all that. And he. He never got his traction back all the way, a little bit, and then he, he was, uh, and he was doing political comedy. He was the only one really doing political humor, strictly political humor at a time and nobody else was, and now everybody is doing it. You know, John Stewart, Bill Maher, and everybody's doing it. It's now kind of boring. I wish they'd get back to, you know, nonsense comedian or comedy mm -hmm. again because, because they've sort of exhausted it. And, uh, uh, but Saul was incredibly sharp, incredibly fast, lightning fast guy. He's kind of a hero of mine. But uh, well, I've, I have heard that he's not the nicest person. Um, yeah, he's a he's a very difficult guy. He can be very nice, and he can be uh, you know kind of prickly, and uh, he uh, doesn't suffer fools gladly, and he's got a huge ego, and he will admit all of this, by the way, which makes him kind of which is kind of a saving grace that people who will admit to their flaws. He, he, he knows this, and he kind of jokes about it. And he wouldn't even talk to me. I'd, I'd interviewed him over the years two or three times and reviewed him always fav very favorably because he's a kind of a hero of mine. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't want to talk to me. I, I, I was just, uh, you know, so disappointed and just kind of aghast at that because we had a good relationship, he says, and he, because it's his vanity. And he says, I was... Well, I don't want to be in that book with all those other guys because he considers himself better than almost everybody. Oh, and uh, so later, though, we did a panel in L.A. He and Tom Smothers and I was a moderator. He came and after he he read he read the chapter I did on him in the book, and he's actually on the cover of the book, which I guess didn't hurt. He was he was apologetic, apologizing all over himself. I should have talked to you. I don't know what's wrong with me and blah blah blah. So he's he's really kind of a good guy, but he's a difficult guy. Did you get the feeling when you were interviewing all these people, the old cliche that most of them are unhappy people? Not most, but but some are. There's no question about it. Jonathan Winters had a dreadful childhood. Saul had a very good childhood. Uh, Newhart had a normal childhood. Charlie Berman had a pretty normal childhood. Um, try, oh, uh, when Nick or Mike Nichols had an unhappy childhood. Uh, you can go down the list, and it's kind of, it's sort of evenly divided. That's kind of a myth that every that they all had unhappy childhoods. I don't think that's quite true. Well, not but, even, but some yeah. of them did. You know, not, not even, a lot of dentists yeah. probably had unhappy childhoods. <laughs> I didn't even mean unhappy childhood. I mean, you can have a perfectly normal or even healthy, happy childhood and still come out a pretty mixed up, screwed up, no, that's unhappy a good point. person. I think that's true. You, you can. Uh, you say, well, uh, you know, comedians are different. You know, they're very different kinds of people. They see the world in a, in a very skewed way, which, if they're any good, uh, you know, is what makes them funny. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and we are speaking with, gosh, I mean, a man with so many acronyms after his name, journalist, writer, and appreciator. I don't know why I said acronyms. That's the wrong word. But he's an appreciator of the things that not only I, but I think we all should appreciate. Comedy radio entertainment humor. He's been a humorist for so many years, and we're talking with him. We were talking about stand-up comedy. Now let's talk about a broader spectrum of entertainment because Gerald Nachman has written a book called Right Here on our stage. Actually, can, can you say it like Ed Sullivan would? Uh, I don't do a very good imitation. Right here on our stage tonight. Not bad. That's about as good as I can do. Ed Sullivan's America. Uh, it's a publication by University of California Press. Ooh. But don't make... Please, folks, do not think that this is some kind of academic treatise or journal. Um, I've, I've started reading the book, and you are a really good writer. Thank you very much. And I don't say this to, to BS or... or, or, or you can say it for any reason. <laughs> Thank you, Accolade. Thank you, Dave. But I can <laughs> tell... I can see how you could have written a column like several times a week and just put these books out because you just have a marvelous flowing style that gets all the facts in, but also is very, very readable. Well, um, that's, the, that's, yeah. the, that's the goal, and that's the trick, is to make it informative but not academic, as you say, and I'm trying to make it, you have to entertain the folks, so you try to be 
be as uh, amusing as you can and still, you know, be informative. So it's it's a balance, and that's that's the challenge of, of a book like this. Now, in investigating and research researching Ed Sullivan, what are some of the things that you wouldn't expect to come out of his life and career? Well, let's see. He was a bit of a womanizer. I didn't know about that. He's kind of because he was kind of a he was kind of a wooden frozen phrase stiff on TV as yeah. everyone remembers but he looked like a bloodhound yeah but what's that and he kind of looked like a bloodhound yeah yeah sort of he was a but in his youth uh, you, you know we remember maybe uh, you remember him because you because you were just a kid as he was like in the 60s then. but uh, in his youth in the 30s he was kind of a good looking guy he'd been a jock and he was mm. uh, you know he was kind of a charming guy he could be he could also be hot-headed and temperamental and difficult like all these guys <laughs> you know uh, but he uh, but he, he was uh, women found him attractive and uh, so, that, so that was kind of new and, and then I found out about his his boyhood he had a kind of a, a difficult boyhood he, people don't know much about it but yeah. everything in his past led up inexorably to the TV show he was an athlete and then he became a sports columnist and then he became he changed then he became a, 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 gossip, a Broadway gossip columnist talking about, you know, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a category that doesn't even exist anymore. He worked for a lot of New York, a lot of New York newspapers and finally wound up uh, emceeing some uh, stage shows in New York. And out of that came the TV show in 1948 in really the first year of television. Well, one of the interesting things, you mentioned the whole sports thing that people might not remember, and you make it clear early in the book that personally he he was awed by talent and celebrity, but he felt a little bit more comfortable with sports figures. And he, that, he, yeah, that was, yeah, that was that was surprising to me, speaking of surprising things. Sure. He, that he didn't mix very much with performers. He was very much at ease with, with athletes. Uh, sports was always his first love, and he used to put a lot of athletes on, on his show. He would in, he either introduce them in the audience or have them like Jackie Robinson or someone come up on stage or Rocky Marciano and kind of, uh, you know, spar with him for fun or talk about hitting with Jackie Robinson because he loved athletes, and, they, and he mixed easily with them. He didn't mix, he was in awe of performers and talent, but he did not... Uh, feel really much at home with them. He only, as far as I could track down, he only had one really close uh, uh, friend who was in show business, a singer named, uh, an older singer named Jerry Vale. Oh, yeah. An Italian singer. I should mention I'm 45 years old, so you know, when, when you say people like Jerry Vale, I do know who they are. You know the name. Well, I always have to be aware that people yeah. you know, 20 and 30 are, are maybe... Uh, not aware of that, but he was—he he sang a lot of Italian songs. He's still around. Now, one of the uh, the other things you mentioned, and I forget their names, I, uh, but that he had quote unquote feuds of some sort with a few people. Now, most of them, most of us think in terms of maybe just one with Jackie Mason, because they have that misunderstanding. Yeah, that's the most famous one because of the, the finger incident, which right. is, everyone wants to know about. And I I did interview Jackie Mason. I should say I interviewed sixty performers. For this book, uh, which uh, there have been a couple, three other books on Ed Sullivan written a long time ago, and none of them, oddly to me, interviewed any of the performers. I wanted to tell about what what the show was like, kind of from the inside out. And the only way to do this is to talk to people who actually played the show, and many of them played it very many, uh, you know, multiple times. So I talked to Mason about the finger incident where Sullivan thought uh, Mason was flipping him off on camera. He wasn't. He was making fun of uh, Sullivan was giving him the one minute sign. Right. He had to cut his routine. And he, Sullivan drove comedians crazy because he was always trying to get them to cut their routines. Because, you know, this, the show was live almost the entire run of 23 years. So that's hard to do to fit in seven or eight sure. acts and make it come out on time. So he would always. Uh, go after the comedians because he felt it was easier to cut jokes than it was to cut a song in half he couldn't do that but but comedy acts are very carefully structured and a joke in the first part may pay off later and, and you just simply can't cut one or two jokes that easily with most comedians so Mason felt uh, it's kind of complicated the, yeah. the studio audience was watching Ed Sullivan giving uh, the one minute sign to, to, to Mason as a result they weren't responding and Mason told me he was afraid he 
home audience, the viewers would think he was dying. So he started making fun of that. He said, a finger for you, and a finger for you, and a finger for you. And Sullivan was offended. He thought he was being flipped off. Yeah, of course, yeah. Sullivan was just, I mean, Mason was just trying to be funny and trying to salvage the moment. But uh, Sullivan was easily offended, had a thin skin. He didn't like to be crossed. And he felt that the Mason was kind of making fun of him. And so he was very, very angry. He almost uh, talked to a guy backstage and said he wanted to, he wanted to punch him out. But So he wouldn't have him back on the show for many years. But did uh, Mason ever get back on the Sullivan show? Yeah, uh, Sullivan, they ran into each other in an airport or somewhere, and uh, they made up. Sullivan was always sorry for some of the feuds he started. He was, as I say, he, he was kind of a volatile Irishman, and he, he would he would blow up, and then it would die, then it would subside very quickly. And he said, "I always went around apologizing afterwards." So he 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 was a he was he was a he yeah. could be a good guy, and he just had a. He was just kind of hot-headed, and he, so he made up with Jackie Mason, and he invited him back on the show, but only once, and Mason told me he thought that was because Sullivan was trying to avoid a lawsuit, because Mason's career had been severely hurt by, yeah, sure. by not being asked back on Sullivan's show, and really not on many TV shows after that, because it was, you know, it was a front, it was front page stories around the country for a while, and Mason was going to sue him, and never happened. The, the judge threw the case out, but uh, it did it did hurt his career for for a while. He worked, but he never worked at TV for for many years. Who were some of the other feudies? Well, Jack Parr was a, was the other major one. Uh, Jack Parr was host of the Tonight Show for you know many years, and uh, and it was over how much they were paying uh, performers. So he said, if the performer goes on the on the if a performer who appears on my show goes on Parr's show. Uh, and performs, he won't be asked back. If he goes on just to talk, then, it's, then he didn't have any problem with that. So performers were sort of torn because they wanted to be on both shows and didn't know what to do. And, it, and then, and then Parr invited Sullivan on his show to have a debate about it. And there was, and, you know, it was on the cover of Life magazine. It was a big, big deal. Oh yeah. Days. And it never happened because uh, one of them or both of them kind of, I think Parr kind of chickened out because he changed the rules. He wanted to have a studio audience. And Sullivan said, you know, nothing doing. That was part of the agreement, no audience. Because Parr knew how to play his audience beautifully and would get all the uh, yeah. people, you know, cheering him and booing Sullivan. And Sullivan was smart enough not to go on in, in, that, in that circumstance. So the thing never happened. Huh. But that was a, that was a big feud. <laughs> Now, when Sullivan's show ended in 1971, it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but I guess it was. Well, it was almost 40 years ago, yeah. 1971, yeah. I, th I thought he was on sort of more into the 70s. Was it his decision, or was it a network decision, or was it both? No, not his decision at all. He was kind of, he was really floored by his decision, because the show had run, it was a habit, it was a national habit, it ran 23 years. It had waned a little, and then it got revived by the Beatles in '64, and then it, then it had a new life with, with in, the, in the rock and roll era. But but as I go into in the book, it kind of ended up hurting the show in a way because he lost some of his older core audience and rock acts. Uh, a lot of rock acts didn't didn't want to play the Sullivan Show after a while, so he kind of lost touch. He, he uh, and and then and then it was ratings also it's always ratings so he he was kind of losing some of the steam I mean, I mean the show wasn't and he was getting older he was he was approaching seventy and he he was kind of losing a little bit he had a little bit of uh, early Alzheimer's his oh. daughter told me and he was he was very forgetful and he sort of lost lost track lost some traction sure and the show just kind of was canceled because it, but it went out and had a lot of good company. Uh, Several Hillbillies was canceled, Green Acres, Lassie, The Andy Griffith Show, a lot of major shows where they just, CBS just cleaned house. They had a new president who wanted more hip, hipper, sharper shows on than those. I'm, I'm curious. Shows. I'm curious what the lineup was on CBS in 1971-72. What what replaced all these? Not that these were all such wonderful shows. I mean, I, you know. well, they had they brought in some. some Better shows like the Mary Tyler Moore Show, uh, which was a little more That's contemporary. Easy. It wasn't like you know, it wasn't no something. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like Green Acres and more some of those shows. And and, the, and uh, 
Columbo, I think, was on. Oh. And, uh, I can't think of any others that are in the book, but they did. But they did. Uh, but you know, the irony is they replaced the Unsolved Show with a thing called CBS Sunday Night Movie, which is just old movies. So they really weren't. They really weren't. Uh, they, they were drawing on the same audience in a way. Huh. And what? Did, how much longer did Sullivan live after '71? What did he do? A couple of years. He died yeah. in '73. Oh, wow. 72 years old. He died in 73. His wife had died the year before, so he, you know, he lost his show and then he lost his wife, and he was really kind of a hollowed out guy by then. And you know, the show was his whole show, and his wife were his, his, the two centers of his, of his life. So he was just, uh, he, he just, you know, and then he had, uh, he always had a, he had a terrible ulcer most of his life, which developed into cancer, and then he, he died. Now, before I, I let you go, Gerald Nachman, and it's been, I, as I figured it would be, it would be so much fun to be talking about your journalism career and also your book about comedians and now your, your book about Ed Sullivan. But you also wrote a book about something that, for obvious reasons, I'm very close to in my heart, uh, growing up on radio. Oh, yeah. Can, can I was you very talk lucky to come to be around when, when radio was in its heyday. It was in my bones, really. It was really, really the easiest book for me to write. Although I, I did a lot of research on that as well and talked to a lot of old-time radio people who are still around, you know, sound effects people and the actors and, you know, some of the writers and stuff that were still around when I wrote it, which was about 10 years ago. Um, so that was a lot of fun to write. That was the closest to my heart of all these. Sure. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, that's called Race on Radio. And uh, I talked about the Lone Ranger and, uh, you know, uh, oh, geez, so many shows. Well, Fibber, Mickey, uh, and Molly, and, and The Dark Shadow, and uh, uh, yeah, 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 Shadow, yeah, Shadow, Shadow. Ranger, and uh, uh, all the westerns, the Texas shows, quiz shows, every genre, comedy shows, uh, uh, Jack Benny show, and Burns and Allen show, and you know, I just it was a lot of fun to write. What I don't understand, I mean, I guess there there are logical explanations for this, but you know, when when uh, Radio came along, the theater didn't die, you know. When uh, TV came along, the movies didn't die. They took a hit, but movies are still a huge, huge business. Why did radio never really come back? That's one of the, that's one of the great imponderables and a very, very sad topic because it could very easily come back overnight. It's a cheap, it's a very cheap form. You just need some microphones and scripts and actors stand around. You don't need sets, costumes, or anything like that. It, it, it actually, it's because, it's because uh, the people who run the radio networks and stations are, uh, you know, want to go for something even cheaper, which is just to have, you know, music, news, and sports, which is the easiest way to go and, and, and the cheapest. And, and nobody has tried to bring it back. You know, there are a few shows, you know, on NPR, uh, that are like it, most obviously the Garrison Keillor show, right. uh, Prairie Home Companion, and, and there's a show like Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and some of those shows. So there's a handful that are like the old radio shows, but but it's nothing like it was when Amos and Andy and Cisco Kid, and you know, it was a, it was a, it was a rich, rich period. The old joke about um, well, it was radio, and yet people would sit around in the living room and they would look. At the radio. Yeah, I know. It's, but I understand I know, that. Yeah. Because people were trend. kind of imagining the people inside the radio performing. You know, it was uh, nothing else to look at. And uh, but it was because it was all in your head. I mean, that's right. the, it's like uh, in in the book I, I I point out that it's the closest thing to reading, where you imagine the characters based on their voices and on the situation. And in that sense, it's the most intimate form of any kind of performance that I can think of. So it too was live for many, many years. And it really just held you fascinated. And, and I, I, I put in three, four hours a day listening to it after school. You'd have sure. Serial, Superman, and Batman, and, you know, Green Hornet and all that. And then after after dinner, you immediately go to my room and start listening to the radio <laughs> until I had to turn my, turn my light off. And, uh, and then I listened to it under the covers. A lot of us did that, too. What know. was your favorite show? I, I like the show which which old radio fans will remember fondly. Most people haven't heard of called The Great Builder Sleeve, hmm. which was uh, it was a, it was a sitcom and it was just about a, a guy who had a niece and a nephew and he was trying to raise them and it was just it was more real than a lot of the other shows. Also, the Jack Benny show was you know probably the, the best remembered and, and probably best written of all the shows. 
And those shows still hold up, and I should say you can still order all these shows. There's a company called Radio Spirits, and you can uh, and you can order the tapes of a, any of these shows. It's still available, and people that don't know about it are amazed at how good they are, and that they and a they are available, and b how many of them hold up. Not all of them, for sure. Right. Uh, some of them are a little tinny and, and cheesy sounding now, but a lot of the comedy shows do. The Edgar Burke and Charlie McCarthy show does. Uh, Burns and Allen, Jack Benny, and, and the Great Village Lee, like that I just mentioned, they all hold up. And there's just, you know, there's thousands, thousands. I have probably a thousand show tapes in, in, in my basement right now. Well, you guys are transferring them to, to CD or to, uh, to MP3s, you know, before those. If, if they're on ferrous oxide tape, they won't be around for Oh, yeah, they're also time. DVDs. I oh. mean, uh, I mean uh, CDs. Oh, okay. Also cool. CDs. Oh, for sure. You can go to, you can go to Borders. They used to be able to, and they have box sets of a lot of these shows. True. But they're really worth investigating because it's a whole new form, and you'll, and you'll be transfixed if you, don't, if you don't have any memory of old radio. And if you do, then you'll be transported. <laughs> now, let me ask, um, you've written the Ed Sullivan book. That is your most recent quote, right here on our stage tonight. Oh, I can't. I don't even. Not even going to try to imitate Ed Sullivan or Ed Sullivan. Something America. he said every yeah. two or three nights, every two or three times during the show. But you've written it, and since you're a writer, that means you're already thinking about your next project, which will be. Well, the next thing I think we're going to write about is nothing to do with. Uh, you know, these three books took a lot out of me in terms of, of research. It's a lot of a lot of work and a lot of time and. I want to write a book, a humor book. I want to get back to humor again. I'm writing a humor book about getting older, uh, which I'm living with every day. And uh, and everybody says, "What's so funny about that?" But there are but there are funny things to write about. And so I've done. I've, I've, I'm about to send a packet out. I, my agent and I are going to get together and soon and, and figure out what I've written about it. Freelance stuff about about the subject, and we hope to find a publisher soon. I'm kind of curious. I mean, it's none of my business, but I am sort of curious. When you write a book about Ed Sullivan or the comedians, which has a certain audience core of however many thousand people who would want to go out and read it and buy it, it and, and yet you have to work three or four years on it to make the book right and do the research. Is that how... How do you make a living? <laughs> well, you get in advance. Right. It, uh, <laughs> the real answer is, 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 is investments. It has nothing to do with, you know, it's very hard to, to make a living in, in, in book publishing or certainly in freelance writing now because, because that has kind of dried up. So um, and I never could really do very well in freelance writing because, you know, magazines are folding and they're changing and editors changing. It's a, it's a nightmare. So I never went that direction. I really went from newspapers right to books and uh, Books are still around and they're still popular and they're still, you know, bookstores and even though the little ones are closing, they're still big ones and they're still online, Amazon and so on. So, uh, But without being John Grisham, you're able still to do a book every, say, four years something like that. and feed um, yeah. yourself. Yeah, you could, yeah, yeah. To help from the you know, money I got from my buyout and you know, mm. my personal investments and all that. But it would have been hard if I just tried to exist just purely on the advance, unless you really hit it big, like you say Grisham or Dan Brown or somebody, it's it's tough. But it's uh, it's the only, it's the best thing left, and I I mm. still enjoy it. And the only problem with it is is you have to wait four or five years to see to see the book to see the thing happen. And I was very spoiled, you know, from writing on newspapers for most of my career of having my name in print and having what I wrote in print. Every uh, every two or three days. Yeah, you know, fifteen yeah. hours after you write something, you there get, it is on your you door. You get yeah. addicted to that, and that was hard. That was hard to give up. But then again, you have this column that you do every once in a while on the columnists, right, right. and so there that, you have it. Right, that feeds that part of me in yeah. a way. Yeah. So read him at thecolumnists.com. Buy his three books, including Raised on Radio, Seriously Funny, and, of course, the new one right here on our stage tonight, Ed Sullivan's America. Gerald Nachman, great, absolute pleasure to talk to you about all these things. Well, thank you for having me on, David. It's been, it's been great fun talking to you, and you're very well informed, and you've obviously read the books, and uh, two of them anyway, and uh, I, I, I've enjoyed it.